Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Supporting Native Bees with Melinda Myers. We're just going to give everyone a few minutes to join our program. So sit back and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We'll get started in just a moment. I see lots of people joining the program here. Welcome. We're just going to give everyone a couple minutes and we'll get started. So thanks for tuning in this evening. All right, so welcome again to everyone who is here for supporting Native Bees with Melinda Myers. My name is Kelly Bolter. I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator at Milwaukee Public Library. And joining us this evening is also Librarian Beth from our East Branch. Uh, Beth and I will be hanging out in the background, um, checking the chat. Um, so please feel free to, you know, uh, talk to each other in the chat box. If you have questions for Melinda, we will have time at the end um, to answer those and have you know a robust discussion tonight um, during this our second webinar uh, with Melinda Myers during Pollinator Month, uh, which is generously funded by American Transmission Company. So a few questions for Melinda, please put those in the Q and A. Um, again, we will have time at the end of the program to answer those questions. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Melinda. We're so happy to welcome you back here today. Thanks so much, Kelly. And thanks to all of you who are making a difference in our community by supporting pollinators, and in particular, learning more about supporting native bees. Now, I want to go on the record as I'm a horticulturist, a plant person and a gardener like you. And so I'm not an entomologist, but I like to talk about how we as gardeners can support native bees and other pollinators. So my focus is going to be a little bit about giving you some insight into bees. And I am always learning something new. Every time I write an article, I prepare a lecture, I do a webinar. And so it's an exciting career for me and an opportunity to share what I learn along the way. I also wanna thank our sponsors, just as Kelly did, American Transmission Company and their Grow Smart program. I teamed up with them a few years ago because American Transmission Company is using that space under their transmission line to build pollinator friendly habitats, including monarch milkweeds for the monarch because they track that corridor where they migrate. And so they're doing their part to help support the pollinators. And they wanted to invite all of us to do our part. And so we're working together to help give you that information so you can do that. I want to thank Kelly and Beth and the Milwaukee Public Library for hosting the webinar. They've been great partners in my whole career. So it's always fun when I get a chance to work with them. And then also the public libraries across the state of Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, because public li libraries have joined us in supporting and celebrating Pollinator Month. So many of them are offering uh, story time, reading lists, teamed up with us, providing information so that we can help you do a better job in supporting the pollinators. And so please check out your handout. I know Beth is po posting it in the chat. There's a link to that handout and there's lots of information and links and it will take you to the atcgrowsmart.com slash library page where we've got all these videos, activities you can do with or without the youngsters in your life, some activities and information provided by the library. So I hope you'll check out that information as well. And the recordings of the webinars will be posted there. So why do native bees need our help? Just like all pollinators, they're suffering and often overlooked. I always say monarch, um, butterflies, and honeybees are the poster children for pollinators, but our native bees are very important. Um, they're efficient pollinators because they purposely go out and gather pollen to feed their offspring. So they're out there working hard for all of us to make sure we have food to eat, but they're often overlooked when we talk so much about honeybees. 
there are 20,000 bee species in the world and nearly 4,000 native to North America. So that's a lot of different species of bees. And when you think of all of them out there in your garden and they're busy doing work, gathering pollen, nectar to feed their offspring and pollinating those plants. And there are 500 species identified in Wisconsin. And that's um, according to, I think it was the Audubon Society. There's a link to that source in your handout as well. So we've got lots of bees that are out there working hard for us, and we want to make sure that we take care of them. Just like many of our pollinators, a loss of habitat is a big threat. So the plants they depend upon, because many of them are very specific, the habitat, the places they need to live are being paved over or destroyed. And so they're really at a threat from habitat loss, but also diseases, predators, and parasites. Now, some of that's naturally occurring, but some of that's being caused by our introduction of other plants and insects into the environment. Probably the biggest threat that we have control over, I think, are the use of insecticides. Obviously, insecticides kill insects, good and bad, and so bees often suffer. Fungicides, which I just learned about a few years ago. So there are some naturally occurring fungi that bees use to make this bee bread that they feed their youngsters. So if we kill fungal diseases, broad spectrum fungicides, we may kill some of the good naturally occurring fungi that the bees depend upon. And then herbicides, plant killers, obviously kill many of the plants they need to pollinate, but some of those um, herbicides are also harmful to the health of the bees. And so we wanna be careful how we use pesticides and whenever possible, avoid them. A lot of you may have participated in No Mo May. And I think one of the biggest benefits of this project was making people aware of pollinators. Um, the idea of No Mo May is there's been research that bees really need those early nectar sources. And many of those occur in our lawn. Some are wildflowers, some are weeds like the dandelions and clover, and that those bees depend upon. And by letting our lawns grow longer, that allows those low growing flowering plants to bloom so the bees can gather and other pollinators can gather the nectar and the pollen they need. Now, if you're trying to grow perfect lawn, you're probably not on this webinar, but if you are, you may wanna skip no mo may and make larger pollinators pollinator gardens. That's a way to help the pollinators and still have the lawn you want. If you're killing the dandelions and clover, obviously you're not going to have those early bloomers. Again, then consider having a larger pollinator garden. Now, if you did do no mo may because you'll tolerate some weeds, that would be my yard, um, because you want to help the pollinators, um, gradually reduce that mowing height. You may already have done it since it's the middle of June, or next year, keep that in mind. Make sure your municipality allows you to do it. You probably found out if they didn't. And then fertilize if you haven't. And I like using a low nitrogen, slow release fertilizer, of course, something like malorganite. It won't burn your lawn when the weather is hot and dry like it is, right? Right now. So hopefully around Memorial Day, you gave it a little fertilization to help it through and recover. And then always use a sharp mower blade because those wounds close quickly, you use less fuel, less water, and your lawn looks better. So no mow may if you're participating next year, if you, you skipped it this year, those are just some things that might help you along the way. So how do we create bee-friendly habitats? This is what I'm all about. It's about the plants, right? It's about how we manage our landscapes. Um, to me, it's the exciting part because we can have beautiful gardens that support our bees, but also provide us with beauty. Now, 90% of the bees are solitary, and I like to say they're neighborly um, because even though they have their own nests, they may have a lot of nests like you see here close together. So think of your neighborhood. It's the same deal for them. So they don't live in hives, but rather have their nest, their own nest, individual nests that may be next to others. 70% are ground nesting bees. Now, I know when I talk about bees and ground nesting bees, I see a, a lot of people kind of cringe because it seems like they always nest where we want to plant flowers or next to the front entrance. And so it's kind of a conflict and it makes us a little uneasy. So one thing you can do is leave some bare soil, preferably on a south facing or a warm slope and away from your home. And that way you're providing space for those 
those bees to nest, preferably away from where you want to plant. And then if you have areas you plan on planting but aren't ready, mulching those right away providing some leaf mulch, some leaf litter, covering that soil so that they go elsewhere in that bare space that you provided is a way that we can coexist because those bees are very important in pollinating as well. 30% nest in holes and trees and plant stems and other places like that. Um, if you've joined me in the past, you've seen the leaf cutter bee. This was um, a picture, uh, one of our photo library pictures. So I'm very excited to share it. But leaf cutter bees nest in sometimes insect galleries. So those holes that insects have made, or maybe the woodpecker going after the insect or in plant stems. And you can see they have a little piece of leaf and they gathered it in this case from a clematis. And it to me looks like just a hole punch. And they take that little piece of leaf and then they use that to line their nest. And that's where they lay their eggs. Now, mason bees have gotten a lot of press lately. And there's many different species of mason bees, but they like mud. So here's what happens. The female backs into a hole. This happens to be a nesting box, but maybe a hole in a tree or a hollow stem, backs in, lays her egg, comes out, gets a little dab of mud, goes back in, seals that egg off, and then backs back in, lays another egg, and repeats this until that tube is full. It's really amazing to watch. I was lucky enough, I was at a trial garden in California, and we stood and watched these bees laying their eggs for 20 minutes. It was great. So if you are trying to attract mason bees, providing that habitat or the leaf cutter bee, having those snags, those trees with holes in them, as long as they're not a hazard, or if you make a house, make sure that you have some mud nearby for the mason bees to seal up their eggs, some plant material for the leaf cutter bees, and then flowers for them to gather nectar and pollen. You can purchase a uh, bee nesting boxes. Here's the thing I like to just remind you is we're trying to help the bees. And if you're going to do a nesting box, cleanliness is very important. You want to make sure that you have holes that are the right size to attract the bees you want, that you provide shelter. You can see this has a little roof, so it protects those uh, tubes where they're going to nest from the weather. And then after they exit, in the spring, you're going to want to make sure to replace them with fresh new wood, clean that out, or some people use paper straws. We have a great video. Well, we have a video on nesting boxes in an activity guide that gives you lots of details. And so if you're in the north, like I am, one of the things you need to keep in mind is the insulation in a nest box like this isn't the same as in a tree. And so you'll need to put these in a place like an unheated garage or shed where it's a little bit protected. I like to put them in a five gallon bucket with a hole. And then as temperatures are hovering and freezing in the spring, you can put it outside. They'll go find a new nest and then you can compost these or discard them and make sure you have a clean nesting box for them the following year. So cleanliness is important, protecting those nesting boxes, make sure they're protected from the weather. Um, but I think the easiest thing is to let your landscape provide it. And I mentioned um, you could do your own. And these are sumac stems I collected, just drilled some holes three to five inches deep, five sixteenth of an inch in diameter, collected those, put them in a bucket so that they were protected by the weather. And then facing your nesting box to the east so that they are warmed up early in the day. And I know I'm covering a lot of details in your handout, uh, warm up during the day. And then that way they get the right environment. You want to elevate your next spot nesting box at least four to five feet. If you're worried about rodents and predators, at least six feet. And if you have bear in the area, and I know some of you in northern Wisconsin do, you want to go eight feet and kind of keep it hidden because you want to protect them from their predators. The last thing we want to do is put this nest box where their predators have easy access to the eggs, the pollen, the nectar, all of those goodies that they're looking for.
Many of our native bees are specialized. This is a squash bee. I actually took this picture in my garden. I happened to find it uh, pollinating my squash plants. So there are a couple that are real specific to certain plants. Uh, mason bees are well known to be uh, pollinators for uh, many of our fruit trees. And so having the plants that they like to pollinate is great. In your handout, for those of you in Wisconsin, there's a great Wisconsin bee ID uh, guide and it's two pages and it's got 10 of the most popular. It talks about the bees, where they nest and the food they like to pollinate. So a little bit more information about them and great pictures as well. I also have links to national websites and the Ohio State University has a great series on Bee Watch. And I wanna thank last, uh, the last webinar, one of the viewers, shared that information with me. So I was lucky enough, that's my alma mater for my undergrad. So it was nice to share. So they've got a series you can watch for more bee information. Now, bumblebees are threatened. And one thing I learned when preparing for this is they're actually using bumblebees um, they're commercially, which I didn't realize. They're very popular for pollinating tomato plants in greenhouses. Um, but we depend upon bumblebees for pollinating a variety of plants. And bumblebees are very different. They live in colonies. So like honeybees, they have a colony of 50 to 500 individuals may live in that colony together. They tend to live underground in old rodent burrows like you see on the left. This was in my garden and I'll have to tell you the funny story about this. And the one on the right was in a shed we were taking down, did not realize that the bumblebees had built their nests there. They were not really happy with this. If you're a gardener, you know bumblebees are pretty docile and you can garden amongst them, no problem, but don't mess with their house. I was cleaning up this garden bed for a uh, a shoot I was going to do for TV and uh, just didn't realize there was a bumblebee nest. They weren't happy, so we let the, I let the weeds go. The good news is they found a new home the next year, and I'll explain their life cycle. So I just let them have that space for the year. Same with most ground bees. They go to a different spot the following year, so just give them a little space. Now, bumblebees are called buzz pollinators. They're big and they're large. And because of that, they generate a lot of heat. So they can start pollinating, visiting flowers early and later in the day than honeybees. They also um, fly and they buzz loudly and they shake and vibrate. And that's how they pollinate many plants. So if you've grown tomatoes, you know, you don't, they don't need to be pollinated to form fruit. However, bumblebees are built specifically for pollinating that flower. And because they vibrate, that's how tomatoes are pollinated. When vibrating the flower, if you go in and shake the plant, the pollen goes to the, from the male to the female part. Well, when the bee, the bumblebee visits that flower, it vibrates and moves that pollen just as the wind does. And so bumblebees are important pollinators for peppers, and tomatoes, and some berry plants as well. But but they'll visit other flowers like the lupine you see here. Um, I want to thank uh, Jeremy for the use of this picture. So here's the life cycle of the bumblebee. So the mated queen comes, emerges from her overwintering spot from the winter. She's out early pollinating. That's a Dutchman's britches we'll talk about in a minute. So she's out foraging for food. Now she's already been mated and she's full of fertilized eggs. And so she's gathering food and she needs to find a new home for summer. So she looks for that burrow or someplace, even maybe an old birdhouse, um, someplace where she can nest. And so she starts stockpiling food. Then in early summer, she makes these wax pots and then she fills them with pollen and lays her eggs. The eggs hatch and there are drone workers. And then there are also females that the drone workers are coming out. And then we, they start gathering food and foraging so the queen can lay more eggs. The fertilized eggs are gonna be the new queens. They are gonna be fertilized by the males. This is in your handout. It's taken me years to kind of understand this. And then the old queen dies. So she's laid her eggs. She he made it through winter, laid her eggs. She dies. The new queens go out and find a place they mate. And then they go find a place to overwinter. And then 
they hibernate for a few months. So they already have fertilized eggs. And then in the spring, they emerge early and the whole process starts. And so that colony that was there in the summer generates multiple new queens that will start their own colonies the following year. It's just an interesting and very different life cycle. Um, there are ways you can make bumblebee houses, but again, I think providing the natural habitats the best we can do, because then we don't have to worry about cleanliness and things like that. There is a link, I think it's to the Xerces Society for tips on building nesting boxes, as well as bumblebee houses. And again, on the activity sheet that goes with the video, making a bee house, uh, there's lots of good information and links as well. Now bees need water. And um, if you're in the Wisconsin area, we're in some pretty extreme heat. And I know a lot of places are always in hot, dry weather. Providing water is really important. Uh, just like wildlife and people, our pollinators and bees need sources of water. So if you can have a bird bath with gently sloping sides, that way they can gather on the edges and lap up the water without going for a swim or drowning. Um, putting marbles in an old bird bath or a shallow container and keeping water in there. Clean it once in a while if algae builds up. Um, just good hot water, scrub it good, clean those marbles and, and replenish as well. What I like to do is I like to just change out my water and my bird bath every time I water my containers. It's part of my habit and that way I don't forget to keep fresh water for them. The other thing you might want to do is provide a puddle. If you've ever been out looking at gravel after a rainstorm, you may notice bees and butterflies gathering. They're lapping up some of that mineral. Well, you can do that just as well. Take a shallow container, fill it with damp sand, bury it in the ground, then sprinkle wood ash or sea salt over the surface. So one, you're helping the bees because they get a mineral rich drink. But the other thing is it's a great photo op as they come and they gather to take up some of that mineral water, you get to watch them visit your garden. And then leaving leaf litter. Not only do butterflies and moths, some um, overwinter or live in the leaf litter, but think about those bumblebees. That queen bee that's made it in overwintering underground needs a safe place to live. And that adds insulation. You know, winters can get pretty cold. So if she's underground, leaving that leaf litter is good for a lot of pollinators, including bumblebees. Then managing your landscape. I think the more we learn about our pollinators, the more we're learning about how we need to maybe vary the way we manage our landscape. So leaving your perennial stand for winter, I've always done it in a matter of keeping the plants hardier, standing perennials are hardier. I think this is beautiful winter interest. I live in Wisconsin, so anybody who's not from Wisconsin may go, oh, you know, we don't have crepe myrtles like they do in Georgia, but this adds interest, food for the birds and homes for the pollinators. And the more we found, the more we decided or learned that we need to leave those plants standing as long as possible. I've even read some pollinators don't leave till June. So minimally, if you can wait till we have several days in the 50 degrees, that's the time you can start doing some of your cleanup. Now, if you're a procrastinator, that's easy to do. If you like to take advantage of that warm day in March and you just can't wait, then pile that debris out of sight. So cutting those stems back to ground level, because we've only left the healthy perennial stand for winter, um, cut back to ground level, but leave some stubble and then stack them out of sight. That way, if there are any pollinators, including native bees living in the hollow stems, they'll still have time to um, exit and you don't have to look at it. There's a great uh, bit of information at the University of Minnesota and they talk about doing the cleanup, but then leaving several stems 12 inches or 8 to 24 inches high so that they can start their new homes again. So you might want to do that. What if you want a bee lawn? So maybe you've decided that you don't have kids playing on the grass, or maybe you want an area that's just for the bees, and you're going to use no mow grass, fine fescues, because those can go long without being mowed or not at all. So once a month, so no mow may would be very easy with this no mow lawn, which is basically a group of fine fescues. And then interplant it with things like creeping thyme and leave the clover and dandelions and all those plants that are low growing that tolerate mowing so that the bee 
bees have access to nectar, you have a grassy area for later in the season. And lawns are nice because they provide a palette, a nice backdrop for your garden, um, some relief. And so you can have a bee friendly lawn. And you may want to have more manicured lawn in another area, but leaving some for the bees. I'm going to talk a little bit about plants. This is always my favorite part. American Transmission Company and I worked on putting together a pollinator guide. It's available on their website to download. There's some videos and more information just to help you pick some plants that will do well in your landscape. When I talk about native plants, and a good friend of mine reminded me that Last time I did, I talked about native plants and not all of them were native to Wisconsin. And I know we have people listening from all over the world actually, um, and we are focusing on Wisconsin. I like to just talk about native plants in general, Midwest, North America, uh, the Wildflower Center, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower dot. Org, I think is their website, is a great resource. They talk about native plants and list the states where they're native. Illinois Wildflowers website is excellent that talks about uh, wildflowers of Illinois. Minnesota has a great site as well. And Vegetation of Wisconsin is an excellent book that talks about those plants that are native to Wisconsin. And so you might want to check out those resources if you're trying to go specifically native to your state. So bees, they're attracted to bright white, yellow, blue, and ultraviolet. And so those are the plants you tend to see them gathering and visiting, gathering nectar and pollen. So I'm going to start from spring, working our way through the season. And I know it can vary depending if it's your front or backyard, if you live close to the lake or out further away, things are a little faster and coming up in the spring and die out faster in the fall with a hard freeze. So start the season with marsh marigold, great for moist or wet locations, bright yellow flowers. The leaves persist throughout the summer. So it's great if you need some early source of nectar for bees and other pollinators. If you have that damp spot, it takes full sun, to shady locations. You'll have great looking leaves all season and those bright yellow flowers to brighten up any landscape in the spring. This is at the Bog Walk at Burner Botanical Gardens. And just you can see the big leaves are skunk cabbage, but this is the marsh marigolds that um, are existing in this boggy location. Trout lily, there's yellow and white trout lily. Look at the leaves, they're very beautiful. Full sun, um, dappled shade works quite well. And they're very, you'll often find them in woodland areas. So in the spring, when they're up and blooming and the leaves are actively growing and photosynthesizing, creating energy for next year, their leaves aren't out. So they get plenty of sunlight, some dappled shade from the structure of those trees. But it's another early bloomer. A lot of our spring ephemerals are very important. And if you have shade in your yard, these are great because you can grow these in those wooded areas or maybe under your street tree where you get light in the spring, but shade later in the season and you'll get lots of early visitors. And here's the white trout lily. Bloodroot, I like this plant because that bright clear white just brightens up that shade garden. Um, when I was gardening in the city in my garden, I had these mixed with ferns and my shady spot in the yard. And it just really brightened up that location, combined nicely with other shade plants and the leaves persisted throughout the year. Called bloodroot because the sap is a reddish orange. So it looks like blood. Dutchman's britches. This is a favorite of bumblebees. Um, it's a relative of um, uh, bleeding hearts, native to the Appalachian uh, mountain area. Great shade tolerant plant, uh, beautiful, beautiful plant. I mean, it's native here. Sorry, I was thinking of fringe bleeding heart, which is native to the Appalachian Mountains. Sorry, got my plants mixed up. This is native here in Wisconsin. Um, it looks like little pantaloons hanging on the stem, and that's where it's called Dutchman's Britches. Um, nice fine foliage. So if you knew fringe bleeding heart that I was kind of re referencing incorrectly, um, you could see the leaves look very similar. This is a spring ephemeral, blooms early in the season. A friend of mine um, in his old house had these outside his, um, the, outside his home in the wooded area on this whole hillside. It was just spectacular. So good bloom in the spring, 
fades in the as the season progresses, but again, a good source of uh, nectar for those pollinators. I'm trying to show you close ups of the flowers and how the plant looks as well, so that you've got an idea of what it's going to look like in your landscape. Baptisia, going from little to big, Baptisia likes full sun, well-drained soils. It's in the legume family, so it's good at fixing nitrogen. It's um, in the pea family. Um, the plants can be up to four feet tall and wide, so give them room. Beautiful blue flowers, great for the pollinators. You can see the bees love it. The leaves hold on all season long. Now, if your plant tends to get floppy, you can cut it back after it flowers. The downside is you won't get those black seed pods that I think look great with the blue green foliage add winter interest. And when I do my cleanup in the spring and the wind's blowing, they kind of rattle like wooden chimes. And so this is a great plant for full sun. It forms a tap root, so it can be hard to transplant. Um, I kind of crowded a few in, so I'm just moving the neighbors. It's easier than trying to move that. But a beautiful plant, native plant. There's a lot of hybridized going on, but boy, I think our native plant's just gorgeous. As you can see, it's big. A perennial salvia. Now I have to tell you, this is in one of my gardens. I took the picture just um, yesterday, actually, and you could see a bee visiting the flowers. There's a couple in that picture. Um, my friend Roy Diblick, who wrote the book No K N O W Maintenance, always called salvia's buddy plant. And I was never a fan because I thought, oh, you've got to remove the faded flowers so that the second flush of bloom shows, and then you got to cut them back so they don't flop open, and and it just seemed like too much work. Well, now I grow, my gardens are in a sandy location and good drainage and my salvias perform well. Also visiting Lurie Gardens, I saw they didn't bother to deadhead. They got the second flush of flowers, but as the flowers faded, they still added beauty and really combined nicely with the alliums and other summer bloomers. This is um, Wazawi. Um, which is a variety that's blooming. It's a shorter variety, does not flop open, vibrant violet flowers. It just knocks your socks off. Um, it's one I want to put more of. Caradonna, if you have heavy clay soil, performs well in heavy clay soil. And May Night, uh, perennial plant of the year, also tends to not be so subject to flopping over. So when you're selecting your salvia, look for one that tends to hold the center, doesn't flop over, and one that'll fit into your landscape design. So I've just, I've given them a second look and I think Roy is right. Penstemon, our native Penstemon digitalis is not only tolerant of full sun and most Penstemon like well-drained to dry soil, this one tolerates moist soil as well. So it's really often used in rain gardens and it's great in areas where we tend to have a little more regular rainfall. Um, excellent plant, the bees love it, visited by hummingbirds as well. It's a late spring, early summer bloomer and will bloom for a good month or more. And then the seed pods that form, I think are decorative as well. It will reseed, not as readily as say coneflower or liatris. This is at Lurie Gardens in Millennial Park in Chicago. If you get in the area, definitely stop by. They have a beautiful garden, a mix of natives and cultivated plants, a small area packed full of plants and lots of people visiting on their lunch hours from the office buildings around. Uh, you may have grown some flowering or ornamental or native onions, nodding onion, autumn onion are some of our natives. Uh, alliums, there are spring, summer, and fall bloomers. Uh, all pollinators love them. Uh, wonderful, they're in the onion family. So if you are weeding out some of those unwanted seedlings, you can tell by just grabbing the leaf and taking a whiff. They all do reseed readily. And so if you're tired of weeding them out or you have enough, um, just remove the flowers before they set seed and drop their seeds. The pollinators are done with them. So once those flowers fade, you won't be interfering with with uh, pollination and gathering of nectar and pollen. And so just remove those faded flowers if you don't want a lot of seedlings. Otherwise, you'll just weed them out, add them to the compost pile or move them to the areas you want more alliums.
Blanket flower, it's a short-lived perennial for those of us in the north. I find it's like pincushion flower that it blooms itself to death. Um, I had some uh, friend gave me some, uh, some of the Mesa series and I had them in front of my house treating them like an annual. They came back the second year. I was ecstatic. They did not come back this spring. So um, they are a long blooming plant. You may end up treating them like an annual in the north. Um, what you want to do is just kind of delay, clean up, watch, get familiar with what the leaves look like, and you may have some seedlings and some of the original plants coming through. Um, lots of yellows, oranges, and reds available. Uh, full sun, well-drained, dry, so dry soil tolerance, so it's good for hot, dry areas, and it grows about 15 inches tall, blanket flower. Lead plant. This is native to Wisconsin and it's forms, it's a kind of a shrubby plant with woody stems. It takes several years for this plant to reach maturity and start flowering. It's a good size plant. It's going to end up being three to four feet tall. The leaves are kind of a silvery. There's some silvery pubescence on the leaves. So they really jump out amongst the greenery. And those flowers are pretty distinct as well. And again, just a close up of those kind of a purpley blue, uh, great pollen source and nectar source for bees. So don't cut it back the first few years. I've talked about Rattlesnake Master last time. Um, it's got very geometric look. And I have to be honest, yuccas were a plant that took me a while to embrace because they're so strong and powerful with their lines. And if you look at Rattlesnake Master with these really round flowers and the leaves look like a yucca, yuccafolium is the species name. It's a very strong geometric shape. But what's cool is you blend it with some grasses and it really creates some nice focal points in the garden. And you look at the Rattlesnake Master, it's visited by a variety of pollinators, not just bees. Good for hot, dry locations, blooms in the middle of summer for several months, no deadheading needed, doesn't reseed readily. So it's a nice one for small spaces. So if you're an urban or a suburban gardener, this is a plant, especially for those hot, dry areas, you might want to include. Catnip. Now you hear the word mint and it might send you out of the room screaming, but don't. Uh, mints can be aggressive. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But Nepeta, we wanna look for cat mints that are clumpers. Some of you may have grown walkers uh, low, which wasn't really low, two to three feet tall and wide. Junior walkers, a little smaller, cat's meow, cat's pajamas. There's lots of more compact varieties. The reason I like the cat mints is they're long blooming and bee favorites. Uh, minimal maintenance needed. Uh, they're fragrant flower, fragrant leaves, covered with bees. If they flop open, cut back halfway, that's all you need to do. I notice some of my older plantings, I have to cut them back a second time, or it just means it's time to dig and divide them because they're outgrowing that space. But flowers all season long, no deadheading needed. Bees love it. Low maintenance, good for full sun, well drained to dry soil conditions. Calamint, not native. Another one that's not native, but boy, look at the bees on this plant. If you've joined me at Energy Park during State Fair, you know we have a planting of calamint. And it's Nepeta Nepeta. Why I included the botanical name just on this slide is to make sure I say, get the subspecies. It does not reseed readily. Um, Calamintha Nepeta does reseed readily. So either one of the cultivars or this subspecies. The clump we have at State Fair Park is probably 10 years old and from three plants, it's really, they're only about three feet in diameter and we haven't had to divide them. Look at that light, airy texture. Great for full sun, well-drained to dry soils. It reminds me of the texture of baby's breath. But if you've tried growing baby's breath, it's floppy, you have to stake it, it doesn't like our clay soil. I find it's not, it's, it can be challenging. This one is easy to grow blooms for several months, mid to late summer, covered with bees, and the bees will not bother you. We have this along a walk at State Fair Park, and it's always covered with bees, and despite all the people walking by, nobody gets stung. Globe thistle. 
Now, I, I was doing some research. I just want to make sure that there were no problems with invasiveness. And I did double check. It's not counted as invasive. Um, I think some people use invasive and aggressive together. For some people, it does recede readily. Mine don't. I'm in sandy soil, and I, I've had to struggle to find the perfect place for this plant. But look at those steely blue flowers. It does have prickly leaves like a thistle, a favorite of the bees, as you can see. This is one of my plantings outside of my fenced in vegetable garden area, but beautiful blue. Um, even in this heat, though, it's kind of really kind of wilting uh, despite the high temperatures, but it's heat and drought tolerant. It perks up in the morning when the temperatures cool down, covered with blooms. Some people say they have problems with it reseeding. Hasn't been for me, but something to keep a watch for. But a nice plant, great. It's about three feet tall, full sun, well drained to dry soil conditions. Great as a cut flower, but you want to leave most of them for the pollinators. I'm not going to say a lot about milkweed because we've talked a lot about milkweed, but just in case you've never joined me before, milkweed's not just for monarchs. As you probably know, monarch caterpillars only feed on milkweed plants, on the leaves of milkweed, but the flowers are visited by bees, monarch butterflies, other butterflies, and hummingbirds. Swamp milkweed, um, I find is less aggressive. If you do have problems with it reseeding, just remove it, but it doesn't spread like common milkweed. It's more of a clumper. And what's nice about it grows four feet tall, um, three to three to three and a half feet wide, will take wet and dry soil. Some people also call this red milkweed, I think because they think swamp is a bad name. I like to include swamp milkweed because we think of milkweed as tolerating dry soils. Swamp milkweed takes it wet and dry, so it's a great plant for rain gardens. And then it's a much bigger plant, as you can see here. I think this is at Dawn who works with me. I think this is one of her gardens and you could see she needed to do a little support to keep it upright. Um, otherwise, I find if you do some grasses nearby, usually that's enough to hold those stems upright. Butterfly weed. Um, a wonderful clumper, smaller, about 18 to 24 inches tall. It needs full sun, well drained to dry soil conditions. If you've tried growing this in heavy clay soil, you may find you plant it where you want it. It ends up growing where it prefers. At least that was the case in my city garden. Now I garden in sandy soil and my butterfly weed just thrive. The beautiful orange flowers look great with blues and purples. As you can see, the bees love it. And it blooms um, middle of summer into fall. This is a smaller milkweed. It's only a few feet tall. Here you can see it's with one of my penstemon prairie drop seed in front. Common milkweed has very, become very popular because of the plight of the monarch. If you have grown common milkweed, you know it can be very aggressive. Sullivan's milkweed is a naturally occurring variety of common milkweed. Uh, it has similar monarch appeal, tends to be a little less aggressive. And so it might be one to consider. So common milkweed's taller, four to five feet. The flowers in this one and swamp milkweed are fragrant in the evening. Again, visited by bees, hummingbirds, butterflies, and host plant for the monarch. Common milkweed has rhizomes that are probably eight inches below the ground, about a half inch in diameter, and they spread aggressively. Um, I have lots of space, but I'm trying to contain the common milkweed on my property. Um, it's winning the battle. And so uh, I've got milkweed everywhere. So before you add it to your small city lot or suburban lot, just be prepared to kind of corral it if you don't want it taking over your landscape. Rudbeckia, there are many different native black-eyed Susan or Rudbeckia. I featured Rudbeckia herta, which is a biennial, but it acts like a perennial because it reseeds ready, readily. So biennials are plants that put leaves up the first year that overwinters, then the second year they send up flowering stems, produce seeds, the seeds drop, the original plant dies, new seedlings form, so they have leaves the first year, flowers the second year, and the cycle continues. Well, eventually you get seedlings coming up every year, so you get flowers every year. Great plant for bees, as you can see, uh, butterflies uh, will nectar on it as well, and birds love the seeds. This does reseed readily. 
So this is one that you may have a lot of seedlings to manage. Not a problem, just kind of a warning. Or plant it with other plants that do reseed readily. And you can see some examples here in this garden. Bee balm, another prolific seeder, uh, reseeder, I should say. Um, by the name, you can tell it attracts bees, but it also attracts hummingbirds and butterflies. It's in the mint family. So if you've grown mint, you can tell that's probably a clue. It's going to spread readily. It spreads by seed and the clumps get larger as well. I call it a little bit of aromatherapy when I'm thinning out the seedlings in the spring. So when I'm thinning out, if I've got too many uh, Monardas. This happens to be Fistulosa, which is um, Oswego tea, also called bee balm. Um, when I'm thinning it out, if I need to thin it out, um, I'll thin it out, removing some of the stems to increase uh, airflow and sunlight to reduce the risk of powdery mildew, but also to help keep it contained. But it has that citrusy minty fragrance. So a little aromatherapy as I'm thinning out those unwanted seedlings. And here you can see. So one of the keys to these plants that reseed readily, like Rudbeckia, coneflower, and bee balm, is putting them in gardens where they have room to grow and spread and can kind of duke it out. And you'll find that they kind of weave in and out and establish kind of their colonies. Now, when you look at a big prairie where they're native, there are clusters of bee balm and clusters of black-eyed Susan and clusters of coneflower. So you may need to lend a little hand to keep them in line if you want a little bit of everything on a much smaller location. Coneflower is probably the most popular of the North American native plants uh, grown in gardens all over. I like the straight species, or if I want a little variety in color, I find Cheyenne Spirit and All America Selection uh, acts like a perennial, will produce flowers of lavender, rust, um, yellow, and purple. But our native coneflower is reliably hardy. Some of the new introductions are borderline hardy or don't perform as well. Um, salsa red is one that's a beautiful red that I've had good luck growing and overwintering even in heavier clay soil. Coneflowers, uh, four to five feet tall. They like moist, well-drained soil, will tolerate drought occasionally. Not quite as adaptable as our native pale purple coneflower. But again, the bees love this, butterflies and hummingbirds, and the birds will eat the seeds. It does reseed readily. So again, just be prepared to do a little thinning if needed to contain the plant. But an excellent bee, bee plant, as you see here. Um, and you can see the cone flowers here mixed in with some zinnias and some dill. Um, if you've grown dill, you know it reseeds readily. And so they can duke it out in the garden. So I love the texture. And dill is a great plant for swallowtail caterpillars and other um, uh, beneficial insects. And we'll talk about beneficial insects next week and the value that many herbs play. Prairie clover, very unique flowers. This blooms July, August kind of time frame. Um, very unique flowers, great for pollinators, especially the bees like this one. Fine foliage, it does develop a taproot. It's only a couple feet tall, so it's a good one for the mid or foreground. Full sun, well-drained soil, its taproot helps it really deal with drought, but just like um, Baptisia, it makes it difficult to transplant. So this is one that you want to plant it where you think it can stay. And if you need to give it more room, move the neighbors instead of this one. But kind of a fun, unique plant. It's not overly aggressive, so it's a nice one for smaller scale landscapes. As you can see here, look at that nice fine foliage. Full sun will take a little light shade, uh, well-drained soils. Ironweed. Um, when I think of ironweed, my, I grew up in Ohio and my grandparents had a farm in southern Ohio and they had a meadow that tended to be the creek would flood out and so it was moist soil and the ironweed there was taller than me, you know, five or six feet tall, bloomed late summer into fall covered with pollinators. And as you can see here, bees. So it's a good one for full sun, part shade and moist soil conditions. So if you've got that area that tends to stay soggy and wet, it's one to consider. But I'm also growing it in sandy soil. I'm growing iron butter, 
butterfly. And does that tell you something about the age of breeders? So iron butterfly. When I saw this plant at the garden center, first I thought it was a willow amsonia with purple flowers instead of blue. And then I read the tag and found it was an iron butterfly. Three to four feet tall, nice fine foliage, um, a little bit smaller scale. So it makes it easier if you've got a smaller yard to use and incorporate ironweed. A good late season bloomer, excellent for those pollinators. Agastache, Agastache, a nice midsummer into fall bloomer. Uh, mine blooms for three months, uh, no deadheading. It does reseed readily, so you will have a lot of seedlings to either enjoy or move or compost. Um, this is a plant from my garden. And this is, um, I've got just a group of, this is my no mate, my no. K-N-O-W maintenance garden uh, inspired by Roy Diblick. And there's uh, skipper, silver spotted skippers on here. There's bees on here. There were swallowtail caterpillars. I was amongst this planting of um, anis hyssop is the common name or lavender hyssop. And um, the bees didn't care. None of the pollinators moved. It was great. I just felt like I was amongst them in my garden. Um, it's called anise hyssop because the leaves have an anisey fragrance. It's in the mint family. So again, the clumps will get larger. It will reseed. It's a long season bloomer with no deadheading needed and a great pollinator plant. Russian sage. Now, if you grew Russian sage when they first came out, some of you may be cringing, thinking about that floppy plant. They kind of get floppy with age or if they don't have enough sunlight or grown in heavy soils. So when we grow Russian sage, it's a great bee plant. It's one that was listed as one of the top 30 bee plants. Um, full sun, well-drained to dry soils. It's been renamed. It used to be Pravskia atroplisifolia. Sounds very Russian, right? Um, but a great plant. And it's called sage because the leaves have a sagey fragrance and beautiful blue flowers midsummer into fall. Now the older varieties grew five feet tall or more and at the end of winter we cut them back to four to six inches and that would help contain the growth. For northerners they tend to die back that much anyway. Now if they grow and flop then you need to prune them one more time about the middle of May cut them back halfway and that usually encourages compact growth. Fortunately, there are lots of new varieties being introduced like Little Spire, uh, Blue Jean, Baby, uh, Denim and Lace that are much more compact and don't flop as readily. And so it might be one of those that you wanna consider if you're adding it. You can see here it's grown with sedum. Uh, it looks like an Autumn Joy, one of the fall bloomers. So it gives you an idea that it's been blooming a while into fall. And then I leave it stand for winter. The silvery leaves and the dried flowers are, add lots of winter interest. And then wait to cut it back in spring. Joe Pye weed. Here's another one for more moist, well-drained soils. Full sun to shade, big plant. It's a big plant. And this is one at Burner Botanical Gardens. It is always covered with bees and butterflies. Late season bloomer. Look at it next to the Rudbeckia, pretty nice and tall. So if you've got, again, a moist area, this is a perfect plant. Little Joe is about three feet tall. Gateway is compact, but it's still four to five or six feet tall. The straight species is even taller. Great blue lobelia or giant blue lobelia, much easier to grow than cardinal flower, has the same bee and hummingbird uh, appeal. It does spread, but I find not too aggressively. It kind of forms a nice colony. Late summer into fall bloomer, beautiful blue blossoms. And you can see the growth habit here. It grows to be about three feet tall. Full sun to part shade, moist, well-drained soil, longer lived, less fussy than cardinal flower. Sedums, there are summer and fall bloomers. There are ground cover types, there are upright types. Great pollinator plants, as you can see here. Um, lots of different foliage selection, flower color, so pick one that fits. They most prefer full sun, well-drained to dry soils. If your sedum is flopping open, check the sunlight. Move it into a sunnier location. Avoid overwatering. If it's still flopping, cut it back halfway, the fall bloomers. In, when they're about eight inches tall, cut the upright forms back about halfway. That'll encourage more compact growth 
smaller but more flowers so you'll still have a great display End the season with some goldenrod stiff showy and blue stem tend to be less aggressive because some goldenrod can be aggressive in fact we weeded a bunch out of our state fair garden one of the nice things about goldenrod it's a great source of food for pollinators before they either go into hibernation like the new queen bees bumblebees or if they're migrating and so it adds beautiful yellow to the fall garden great as a cut flower but be sure to leave plenty for the pollinators and an excellent source of food for those bees at the end of the season um, prairie nursery has great profiles on native plants and he talks about those that are suitable the goldenrod suitable for urban and suburban landscapes and those that are a little more aggressive. Asters, one of the last hurrahs of fall, uh, they can get floppy. So put them next to grasses or plants that will help support them or cut them back early in the season throughout the month of June, keep them six inches tall. They'll be more compact, delays flowering a bit, but you'll still get that great source of nectar for our pollinators at the end of the season. Uh, most asters like full sun to part sun, moist, well-drained soils, some are shade tolerant. Chicago Botanic Garden evaluated asters, cultivated asters, and I put a link to their evaluation. They do, Richard Hockey does excellent plant evaluations in the Chicago at the Botanic Garden. They have heavy soil uh, in the Chicago area, so Midwest, Zone 5, um, B. And so it's a good place to find out they evaluate a lot of the cultivars and provide some good beneficial insight, um, but a great plant to end the season. Steeple bush, this is our native spirea, so not one of the invasive ones. Um, it's native to meadows and prairies and marshy areas. So again, if you've got that damp area, it's a tall plant. It's a woody deciduous plant. I just wanted to throw a couple of shrubs in here, but you could see it in its native habitat, those upright plumes of bloom, beautiful in the landscape and then dry nicely. So some seeds for the birds. New Jersey tea, full sun to part sun. Um, first time I saw this was in um, uh, up in a, a national forest in northern Wisconsin, growing in a shady area. Um, if anybody's from California, it's a Ceanthus. It's the genus. It's related to the summer lilac. That's a blue flower, native and to the west coast. But this one's a great pollinator plant. You can see the soldier beetles there, along with the bees uh, pollinating. So a summer bloom, great flowers. It grows to be about three feet tall. The shrub. So a nice shrub that you might want to add to those partially shaded areas. Herbs, I'm going to quickly go through herbs. Um, we think of harvesting before they flower for the best oil concentration for eating. If you're like me and you're a procrastinator, I always have mine blooming. Many of the flowers are edible, but they're great for the bees. Mint is very aggressive. Grow it in a pot, put it on a patio. This is a brave gardener that put it in their garden. Uh, some people will sink them in a pot or a big container. I've seen them ease their way out, but usually it slows them down a bit. Full sun, well-drained to dry soils. Creeping thyme, this is one that some people are using in their bee lawns. Fragrant foliage, um, excellent around steppers. Um, the bees love this, so if you're using it around steppers, just beware. And then here's creeping thyme in a garden. So edible, ornamental and fragrant and great for pollinators. Oregano in the mint family, um, it's aggressive. So this is another one that needs to be contained. I have mine in a pot on my patio and it receded into the grass that's probably 15 feet away or into the mulched area. So it is rather aggressive. So you need to keep an eye out for any unwanted seedlings, but it's an excellent bee plant. Full sun, well-drained soils. Again, keeping it in a pot, good idea. Beekeepers I read use borage, which is an annual in my in our area, reseeds readily. So it will it will grow and spread. We had some kind of taking over an area at State Fair Park. If you are a neat and clean and tidy gardener, you probably weed out the seedlings. Um, but the, the leaves have got a nice pubescence to them. So it's a soft green. The blue flowers are gorgeous. It's a prolific bloomer. It will reseed and you can eat the flowers as well. 
Here it is mixed with heliotrope. I'll talk about that purple flower in a minute. I love this combination. Lavender, full sun, well-drained soils, fragrant leaves, flowers, excellent pollinator plant, a little challenging for those in the north with heavy clay soil. Hidcote, H-I-D-C-O-T-E, and Munstead, this is in your handout, M-U-N-S-T-E-A-D, tend to be the hardier ones. And a relatively new one called Phenomenal, which is phenomenal, it's huge, um, will also uh, overwinter in colder climates. Full sun and good drainage are the key to success with growing lavender. A couple of annual, annuals, pop marigold or calendula. It's edible flowers. Flowers best in cool parts of the year, spring and fall. But there are some varieties like Pacific that are more heat tolerant. So look for those if you want blooms all summer. Or I mix them with other annuals or perennials. So when they're not flowering, something steals the show until they come back in bloom. The flower petals are edible, used for seasoning soups and stews, which are made in pots, thus pot, pot marigold. And here's the plant. So it's about 18 to 20 inches tall, uh, yellows or oranges. Cosmos, I like bipinnatus with the ferny leaves. It can be anywhere from 18 inches to six feet tall. It's an annual that reseeds readily. Pollinators like bees love the flowers. Finches will eat the seeds. Um, again, this is one that will reseed. So if you plant it once and you watch for those seedlings, you don't have to plant it every year. There are compact varieties like Sonata that only grow about 15 or 18 inches tall. Begonias, uh, the flowers are edible. I ate begonia ice cream once, but begonias are great. I like the Whopper Big or the Big or Dragon Wing series that grow well in full sun or shade, bloom nonstop all summer long and need no dead heading. Great pollinator plants and the bumblebees love these. Heliotrope, fragrant flowers, more readily available, a wonderful annual um, that I, it tends to be pricey, so I put a couple of them in key places where I want to attract the pollinators and enjoy the fragrance. Uh, whites, kind of a pale lavender and purple flower. Some people have success overwintering them indoors for winter to put back out in the garden in the summer. And here you can see it's about a 15 inch tall plant and you can space these about 12 inches apart. They're good size annuals. I always like to talk zinnias. Not only are they great pollinator plants, but if you want to stretch your plant budget, you can start these from seed right in the garden and you'll have flowers in about eight weeks. Single varieties of zinnias and marigolds are the best for pollinators. More nectar, fewer petals, more of the reproductive flowers that have the nectar in them. So looking for things like profusion or Sahara that not only are disease resistant, but look for those single flowered varieties. I also like zinnias because they hate, take the heat and the drought very well. So once established, they're going to really tolerate hot, dry weather. Here you can see some in the foreground that are single, some doubles in front of some hydrangeas. And annual salvias, excellent plants for pollinators, including bees. And then the finches like to eat the seeds. My favorite is black and blue salvia. It's big. And for some of you, if you're from milder climates, it's hardy. I think it's zone, it's maybe seven, or I think it's zone seven to 10. Check your handout. It's not hardy for me, but it's a beautiful big plant that the hummingbirds and bees love. So one plant, great vertical accent in a container, or you can see here in the garden, does well in full sun. And don't forget sunflowers. We have a sunflower project. Um, we're trying to get people to plant sunflowers in their garden or in a pot if you don't have room. Great plant for kids. Um, we did a sunflower project years ago, and we had people sending in pictures of their kids and 90 year old sunflower growers enjoying the flowers and the pollinators that come to visit. If you grow sunflowers, please share your pollinator projects with um, us through social media at hashtag GrowSmart22. We want to inspire others with all the things that you're doing. So sunflowers, anywhere from two feet tall to 12 feet or more tall, full sun, well-drained soil, drought tolerant. 
Um, hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies will nectar on the flowers. Birds and squirrels will eat the seeds, and you can too if you can beat them to the seeds. And you'll probably get some volunteer plants coming back the next year. I always like to end my talks with asking you to help me grow gardeners. Someone inspired you, and if you're new to gardening, welcome. We are so excited to have you with us. If there are youngsters in your life, inspire them. You know how good you feel when, feel when you plant flowers, follow the progress of your garden, pull weeds is even therapeutic. Kids are more focused. They exhibit less ADHD symptoms. Girls uh, raised in a landscape environment suffer less peer pressure. So help inspire the next generation or your neighbors down the street. My goal is to grow a kinder and gentler world, one garden and gardener at a time. So I'm going to need your help to do just that. June's Pollinator Month, please celebrate with us. And Kelly reminded me, I forgot to include my Call Diggers Hotline. She's starting a new garden and she reminded me that she called Diggers Hotline. You can call 811 anywhere in the country or file online at Diggers Hotline. Um, Dot com and three business days before you put the first shovel in the ground. It'll keep you safe. It'll avoid the inconvenience of knocking out cable. And if you hit an underground utility and you didn't contact them first, you have to pay for the repair. It's a free service. So give three business days notice before you start adding those pollinator plants to your landscape. Um, next week, I'm going to be talking about maintaining your landscape with pollinators in mind. Sometimes we get uninvited insects and diseases in our landscape. We want to keep those pollinators safe. Next week's webinar will stop start at 630. So be sure to tune in at 630 for that. Again, thanks to American Transmission Company for their sponsorship of this webinar and Pollinator Month as well. Milwaukee Public Library uh, for hosting the event and the other public libraries across the state of Wisconsin and the UP of Michigan because they're doing wonderful projects for people that come to visit. They're about education and inspiration. So check with your local library. There's probably cool activities you can join in. Please stay connected. And I know I'm behind on answering questions. I get caught up every once in a while. So please be patient um, and don't don't hesitate to follow me on Facebook. We do daily posts. Need to beef up my Instagram uh, pictures. I got lots of things from the garden I want to share. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Kelly and Beth. So um, I want to thank you. I went a little over my one hour, but I will stay until we get those questions answered. And I appreciate you letting me go on and on about the plants and the bees. Thank you so much, Melinda. We are more than willing to go over time. Um, you know, this is always a fascinating um, educational session with you. And, you know, I know Beth and I have been doing these with you for a while now. We always learn something new. And it's just, it's fun to be able to share that knowledge with everyone. So we do have quite a few questions coming okay. here. Um, so just to everyone, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Um, and we will go through all of those this evening and answer them. Um, we've had a few questions from people asking for the handout, so we will email that as a file attachment um, with a link to this webinar within a few days, so be on the lookout for that. We send it to the email address that you registered um, for the program with, so um, you will get that in your email very soon. So let's start here, go to our questions. Uh, we have a question from Karen. Uh, Karen says, I put a trout lily in about 15 years ago and they've never bloomed. I have many leaves. They are uh, planted in a tree line. Do you know why they haven't bloomed? You know, wildflowers are a little bit tricky. And I was, when I was doing a little research on trout lily, that is not uh, uncommon for them to uh, keep producing leaves and taking a while to reach maturity and start blooming. It sounds like if you're getting leaves, they're in perfect growing conditions. Um, and if they're growing, that means they have the right soil. And I think it's just one of those of being patient. Uh, if you are fertilizing, I would stop fertilizing. I just use compost to add any nutrients. If you feel you need to add nutrients to the soil, uh, fertilization, uh, especially high nitrogen fertilizers, if you're fertilizing a nearby garden bed, uh, that might be impacting it. So 
watch your fertilization. That could be one issue. Just use compost or organic fertilizers. Um, anything, if you think they need a nudge, but I think it sounds like they've got plenty of nutrients. I just give them some more time and let them get started. A question from Francis. Can you mention the risks of using the insect zappers? Mosquitoes are not oh. attracted to UV light, but these are. Good point. Uh, you know, the zappers, they, it's a great marketing device that it's not helpful. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, actually, dragonflies having, if I'm lucky, there's a wetland not too far from me, and I've got tons of dragonflies. I have water and plants they like. And so I've got plenty of dragonflies that eat lots of mosquitoes. So some of the other things, I'm glad you brought that up. The other concern, besides the bug zappers, which aren't doing the mosquito control, is spraying. I think sometimes there's a disconnect between, um, I've had some people talk about spraying for mosquitoes, spraying their lawn, and insecticides kill good guys as well. And so again, if you're spraying your lawn or your shrubs where mosquitoes tend to kind of hang out, you're probably knocking down some of the beneficial insects as well. Um, some things you can do for mosquitoes that might be helpful. Um, fans work great. And I know some gardeners that take box fans out into the garden with a long extension cord and have it running because mosquitoes are weak flyers. That keeps them away. If you're entertaining in the evening, uh, having a fan going, again, because they're weak flyers. Citronella oil and candles only provide a little bit of control, a smaller space. But if you put candles throughout the area so they're nearby all your guests, that's another way to help reduce the risk. Um, if you if they're coming in your house, make sure your screens are intact and there are no, you know, cock any openings as well. If you have standing water, that's where they tend to breed. So water features, I said water is important for pollinators, including bees, changing that water regularly. That's why I, you know, every time I water my containers, I change the water in my bird bath. And that way I have fresh water for the birds and the bees and the butterflies and the larvae of the mosquitoes can't survive or put a pump in there so the water moves. And that's really attractive to birds as well. Or use a mosquito dunk, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, Kirkstachia. Yes, it's that strain. I have to think about is no, Israeliensis, BTI, Israeliensis, sorry. The strain that kills mosquito larvae, you'd throw one of those in your rain barrel or your water feature and that will knock them out and it won't hurt the beneficial insects. Um, someone told me Doug Talame, and I haven't checked this uh, source, is recommending putting straw in water to create a mosquito friendly environment, then sticking one of those mosquito dunks in it so that it attracts the mosquitoes to lay their eggs and then the larvae are killed. Now, traps are always that, are you bringing more in or keeping them away? So putting that at the edge of the property. So you might wanna do, I need to do a little bit more research on that just to see. I just learned that from the Elm Grove Beautification Committee is recommending that as a control method. So it might be something to check out and give it a try. I'm gonna do that this year, I'll let you know. Yeah, thanks for the solutions to mosquitoes. I, I don't know if anyone out there is um, uh, a sufferer from Skeeter oh. syndrome. I just, I found out I am. So we just, you know, try to avoid oh. those painful bites. Um, but yeah, I've done the box fan thing and it does work. Okay, let's see, we've got more questions here. Amanda would like to know, last year the leaves on my newly planted swamp milkweed developed yellow leaves and fell off quickly. Could this have been a bacterial or, or fungal issue? Is there anything that I can do to make sure this doesn't happen again? So, okay, so good question. So when I start seeing problems, and next week when we talk managing, we're gonna talk about a little bit about identification of problems. So the first thing I always like to do is check the soil moisture, even though they tolerate wet soil conditions. Is it heavy clay that was soggy wet for too long of a period that can cause it? If it's a disease, we typically tend to see um, 
irregular spots. Yellowing of leaves to me says something's going on with the roots. Was something eating the roots? Was something damaging the roots? Was there some kind of uh, soil moisture issue to dry? Last year was a pretty hot, dry summer. I'll tell you, I think I spent the whole summer dragging hoses instead of weeding. So, you know, even though they're drought tolerant, there's a point where some plants just can't tolerate it. I mean, just if you've got any things in pots that like moisture, boy, they took a beating these last couple of days in southeast Wisconsin. So that I would monitor the weather. The other thing I would do is if it's a virus, usually it's more of a mottled look, irregular lights and darks versus a solid yellow. If it's a fungal disease, it's usually a spot or irregular brown spots on it. So a couple things, um, I would monitor the growing conditions in the weather and the soil moisture. Um, if it does start to develop, uh, you can always take us extension offices they vary with how they manage samples because they're understaffed and some offices do take them and some don't the uw plant disease diagnostic clinic there is a fee for diagnosing samples sent in but i would visit the uw it's the if you just google uw extension plant disease diagnostic clinic that'll get you to the website brian huddleson and his team are excellent. Sometimes they can answer the questions um, when you give it to them. And they also do an almanac. So they tell you what's happening so that, you know, oh, this is going on with this plant. And it sounds like what's happening to my plant. So it sounds like it could be environmental. It could have been the hot, dry weather last year. Watch the soil moisture, even though they are drought tolerant. Um, and then watch how it progresses because how a disease or insect problem progresses can help us identify the cause. So keep an eye on it. Um, info at melindamyers.com. If you email me, you can attach a, pitch, a picture. Sometimes a picture helps me identify the problem as well. Um, and again, the Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic is a great resource. Right. And I hope I'm pronouncing um, your name correctly. The question from Balu um, built a high ground nest for mason bees and okay. sprayed lemongrass oil, um, but no success. Any tricks to attract mason bees? So good, good question. First of all, when we put out houses, it's just like a, a hummingbird feeder, right? Sometimes they don't come right away. And so you have to be patient. Make sure that you've got plants in the area that they like to pollinate. So plenty of flowers to bring them in. Make sure there's a mud puddle, either one you create or a wet, muddy spot nearby. So, and then being patient and waiting. They may not find it that first year. And so, put it up in the same spot next year and be patient. Um, it's kind of like, you know, you put it out and you have to wait. And uh, they are out busy nesting right now. Leaf cutter bees go a little bit later in the season, but mason bees are out. So hopefully they'll still find a spot for, find your nest box as well. Okay, Frida says, you mentioned wood ash is a good nutrition uh, source for pollinators. Is that any wood ash from our fireplace or is it something else? Good question. So you want to make sure it's wood ash that's not been treated, you know, some, you know, so if you have a, a fire and you just burn twigs and branches and logs from your trees, that kind of wood ash would be fine or sea salt. I use sea salt because I don't, have fires on a regular basis and all my wood just can fall in the I'm lucky in the forest and not as a, isn't a hazard so just it's got to be natural wood not anything that's preserved or treated so good question um so yeah anyone in southeastern Wisconsin maybe you experienced this Heidi says we've got a hailstorm and it shredded all the flowers is there anything special that um, can be done for the bees like if there's been damage to things that are blooming already you know Heidi and if you're the one that emailed me that question I hope so I can answer and take it off my guilt list now um boy hail is I would just say you know what there are a lot of depending on where you live, some garden centers still have flowers for sale. And uh, 
they're reasonable. So it may be one of those things that you want to just pot up some extra flowers, you know, some zinnias, some single marigolds, um, some of the heliotropes, some of these plants we've talked about, put them in a pot or two if you don't have room in the garden until your plants recover. Um, I like to do containers um, as well as I have lots of space to garden in the ground. I could bring the pollinators close to my house to enjoy them, but it's also something I can move inside. Um, I've got some stuff in the garage because of this heat is so terrible and un, in the shade. Um, and for the hailstorms too, I, and I, boy, I was lucky I escaped this last one, but I would maybe supplement with some containers. It's always fun to have extra flowers, put them in some pots, you can put them on your patio, your front steps, your deck, stick them in the garden, where those flowers have been devastated or next to that garden area. And as your plants recover, you can move them to another place to enjoy. But I'd, I'd pick up some annuals to just supplement until your plants recover. Right, so yeah, for everyone still here, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Still looking through our list here. Um, Amanda says that uh, they're hoping for individual help with planning out a perennial flower garden. Is there a good resource that, um, if, you know, if you're in that situation that you can contact for individual help with planning? So yeah, and you know, I, I, if I ever can figure out how to do a design webinar and do it effectively, I will, because I know this is a really tough sit question that people face. So a couple things you can do. Um, Tracy DeSabato Aust, A-U-S-T, wrote the book, The Well-Tended Perennial Garden. She also wrote a book on perennial Plant Design, I think, is the name of it. But if you look it up at your library, um, Tracy DeSabato Aust, A-U-S-T, uh, DeSabato is D-I-S-A, B-I-T-O, you could get there. <laughs> the librarians will help you. Anyway, she might have some good pointers. Some garden centers offer that service if you... Um, you know, buy your plants from them. The problem is usually when we're all shopping, they are so busy, all they can do is check us out, right? But that might be an option. The Wisconsin Landscape Contractors Association, if you're in Southeast Wisconsin, uh, find a landscaper.org. Uh, companies that belong to the Wisconsin Landscape Contractors Association, Milwaukee Metro chapter, um, list their businesses and you can do a search and some of them, some will deal with smaller um, situations. Some garden centers have design partners as well that they'll recommend to help you. So you might want to contact your local garden center, go to findalandscaper.org, scroll through there to see if you can find someone. And what's nice is they have pictures of the jobs they've done. They talk about the kind of work they do as well. So those might be a couple of places to find some help. You know, and even too, um, if you're out and about, like at Burner Botanical Gardens, for instance, even just, I like to take pictures, you know, of, uh, of groupings that, that look nice. That, that's a nice way to get inspiration too. And garden walks. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, Kelly. Because even though sometimes people go, oh, you know, they have gardeners in this huge area. But like you said, Kelly, take the picture of the combinations you like. You know, they have some shade gardens. So if you have a shady area, look at what's growing well there. That's a great suggestion. Plus, you know, this is what they look like. And go often. Because if you visit on a regular basis, you can see what they look like throughout the season. So thank you. That's a great, great suggestion. In Wisconsin, there are wonderful botanic gardens across the country. Wisconsin has Burner Botanical Gardens um, in Southeast Wisconsin, Rotary Gardens in Janesville, Oldbrook and Allen Centennial in Madison. Green Bay Botanic Garden is amazing. Uh, the Twin Cities uh, Landscape Arboretum is great. Chicago Botanic Garden, go with a plan. It's huge. So I always like to have a plan because I don't wanna waste time trying to figure out where to start. But we're lucky to have a lot of great botanic gardens and check for garden tours because gardeners love to share and you'll find some great ideas there. Sure. Okay. Still working through our questions here. So again, if you have any um, questions that you'd like to ask Melinda, just drop those in the Q&A. Um, Chad is asking, what is the best soil prep for bee plantings? Um, looks like they have uh, calumet 
globe thistle and catnip. I have clay soil now. Okay, so good question. And maybe I need to, I just was finishing prepping for next week. Maybe I need to put soil prep in there. So for an existing garden, if you've got a garden that's not performing real well and you've got heavy clay soil like so many people or a disturbed site from building and construction and you know when they build our houses, one thing that you might wanna do is put a, an inch or two of compost, find a good source of a quality compost or if you make your own and then take a drill with an auger bit. And they sell those often where they sell bulbs or in the hardware store and do what's called vertical mulching. So I've spread my compost around my perennials, the existing perennials, then I take my drill and I drill in those voids between the plants. It aerates the soil, breaks up some of that clay, pushes some of that compost into the root zone. And so that's a way, if you've got a garden that's not bad enough to start over, but one that needs a little help, that's a great way to do it. Using organic mulches. I love to use leaves, they're free. A lot of pollinators like to hibernate in them or live in them. And as I mentioned, bumblebees like the insulation and so do the toads and frogs. And so just gathering leaves that, when I lived in the city, they I don't know where they came from, but they collected along my fence line and all over. I always had plenty of leaves. They make a great mulch. And as they break down, they improve the soil. And so any organic mulch is a good way to do it especially leaves even evergreen needles won't make your soil too acidic so that's also helpful for areas where you're not trying to invite the ground bees um, with there's no dig soil and i'm working on a blog for malorganite that's due real soon on no dig but you need to start a year in advance and that's just creating soil on your existing soil rather than digging in compost um, adding compost to heavy clay soil when you're starting a garden is a way to do that as well, or create the soil using lasagna or hugel culture gardening, where you use kind of it's like composting on the soil surface to create soil either in a raised bed or just let it stand alone, and then plant in that and that's wonderful and a quick way to build good planting mix so I'm glad you asked that question really proper soil preparations critical when growing plants, especially healthy plants. We want healthy plants so we don't have to use pesticides. And so we get plenty of blooms for the bees. So thank you for that question. Excellent question. Okay, so the last couple questions here. Um, Marilyn asks, what are your recommendations for fertilizing perennial plants throughout the blooming season and thereafter? You know, the Perennial Plant Association funded some research a while ago, and they said if you had prepared your soil properly, and then you spread compost over the soil surface every other year, or every third year, that that was enough for most plants. And so you've probably heard about soil biology, or maybe not, but if we build our soil, we don't have to fertilize as often. Now, I like to disclose I work with malorganite. I always used it before I started working with them. One reason I like it, it's 85% organic matter. So it feeds the soil. It's low nitrogen and slow release. It's a bio, the byproduct of our wastewater treatment. It's a biosolid. So some people choose not to use those. And I totally understand that. So if that's not one that you opt to use. You might wanna look for some organic or other low nitrogen, slow release fertilizer. Perennials really don't need to be fertilized that often. If you have heavy clay soil, the good part is it holds moisture, sometimes too long, but it also holds nutrients. I have sandy soil now, so I'm really trying to build my soil um, using organic mulches, uh, using the malorganite. I have to fertilize in the spring when I plant. Um, and actually I'm amazed at how little I have to fertilize um, because of my use of organic mulch materials and organic matter to help improve the soil. So at planting, you might wanna use a low nitrogen soil release as you prep the soil, then let your plants be your guide. Um, I think we tend to over fertilize. Um, and so some, you can always add more, you can't take it away. So when you prep your soil, you know, adding organic matter, using organic mulches, consider using an organic fertilizer or something like a malorganite that's going to feed the soil. And then let your plants be your guide. You may not need to fertilize again till next spring, or maybe 
every other year, just use compost on the soil surface and then spot treat those heavier feeders. Things like Baptisia are fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere. It works with a bacteria in the soil. And then when the old roots die and that bacteria releases the nitrogen for the Baptisia, but also for other plants. So it fixes nitrogen with its symbiotic relationship to add it to the soil to help feed the soil. I did a, a, a blog from Alorganite on companion planting. You might wanna check that out. And I talk a little bit about companion planting to build our soil, as well as to help manage pest problems. And our final question here is from Jill, um, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, is Berea japonica considered invasive or aggressive? My foundation plantings did reproduce a bit, which I cleaned up. And it's Spirea, S-P-I-R-A-E-A. Oh, spy, Spirea, okay, Spirea. japonica, okay. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for spelling it. Spirea, yes, Spirea japonica, they are finding that Spirea japonica's are turning up in woodlands. It's not on the restricted list, I don't think, for Wisconsin. Um, when I redid my Midwest Gardener's Handbook, I removed some plants that were invasive in the Midwest or threatening to be invasive. There, um, so there are a few breeders that are looking at introducing some spireas that are not invasive, japonicas, but um, it's one of those that kind of monitor the area. If you live in the heart of the city, those are tough plants. You know, they tolerate a lot of abuse. That's why you see them in parking lots. If you're living near a woodland area or a prairie, uh, those look for some other native options instead. So I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources on their invasive pl plant portion of their website talk about plants that are restricted, those are prohibited, and those to watch for. Invasives.org is a great resource because not only do they talk about what's invasive, but they show where, where they have become a problem. So you can kind of see if it's an issue. For example, barberries um, are invasive and you know we use those in landscapes extensively and it just is showing up in certain parts of the country butterfly bush is invasive in some parts of the country you know we can't sometimes get them to live here the butterfly bush not butterfly weed um, but some people there are some sterile varieties and there are some people that opt not to grow butterfly bush even though it's not invasive here because it can be invasive where the nursery is growing and propagating them. So it's a personal choice. So invasives.org is a good place to go um, and check that out. Great. So it looks like that wraps up our questions for this evening. Thank you so much, Melinda, for uh, being so gracious always with your time and uh, answering everyone's questions and just extending this education hour, uh, which is always so much fun. So uh, for those of you that are still here, just you know, we've got a third webinar coming up next week, Wednesday, which will be at 6.30 p.m. Um, so we will send out a registration link along with our follow-up email, which will include the handout that we went over today, and then also a link to this recording, which we'll post on the Milwaukee Public Library YouTube channel. Um, we also have a Green Ideas playlist on that channel as well, which we'll link to. So you can see, you know, more of the sessions with Melinda, um, programs that we've done with MMSD and other topical programs as well. And please tell your friends about the recordings because we want to help spread the word. And so maybe they couldn't make it tonight. It's available, as Kelly said, on the YouTube channel. So they can go and visit at their convenience. Check out the handout and um, you could help me and Kelly and Beth spread the word. Definitely. Well, um, be safe out there, everyone. If you're um, in southeastern Wisconsin, I think we've got some storms coming in. So be safe and stay cool. It's been a, a hot week and I think next week will be pretty hot as well. So, um, so thanks for tuning in this evening. And like I said, we'll follow up with that email with all the information we discussed here tonight. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week, Wednesday, June 22nd at 6.30 p.m. So thanks so much, everyone. And take care. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye.